from the Lord Jesus, the great judge priest of the church, walking among us, says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent, five of the seven churches, repent, 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 repent. Do you know what God did to Elimelech? He took away all the breadwinners in the entire family. Elimelech died. Marlon died. Killian died. He touched the source of their human ingenuity and wisdom. And that is what God is doing in the West. I hear people saying, oh, and it's right, oh, this credit crunch, this economic crisis is making so many unbelievers think of God and turn to God. Oh, yes, please God for that. But this is God's people. Highlands Day was due to God's people. Is it not making us think? Where are your treasures? There are your heart fields. God often has to come in when we wander away from him and strip us. Strip us of all the crutches we have, all the breadwinners that substitute him and the house of bread. And this is what he's doing. Why? To bring us back to himself. To show us the error of our ways. To show us that we have hewn out systems that we've made ourselves and we're not living from the living God. He gives us death. Desolation. He allows us to go into Moab and it becomes a graveyard. Let us turn our attention away from this sojourn in Moab to the return to Bethlehem. For this is the road to revival. And there are three characters on that road that I want you to see. The first is Naomi. And we read in verse 20 and 21 of Naomi's confession. And I think these must be two of the most saddest verses of the whole of Holy Scripture. Naomi confesses verse 20, chapter 1. Call me not Naomi. Call me Mar, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Now remember, Naomi means pleasant or joyous. And here she's saying, don't call me by that name because I'm not living up to that name. And we heard earlier what names mean. I'm not joyous. I'm not pleasant. I'm Mara. Bitter. I've lost my joy. And this is what the church in the West, and this is what more and more of a remnant are realizing. That nothing can be a substitute for the joy of the Lord. Nothing can fill that void. Nothing can be an imitation. It is an item. We cannot be satisfied with anything other than the living God. See Naomi sinned in becoming bitter. Look at it again, please. Verse 20. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Her memory was very short. She forgot that it was her decision, along with her husband, to leave the house of bread. And how easily we can become bitter in the, in the things of God and so many believers. And if you're in an involved in a local church, you will know this. So many are eaten up with bitterness. And it might be legitimate things that were done against them that were wrong, clearly. And yet the bitterness has eaten them up. As Hebrews says, a root of bitterness has come into their heart. And it doesn't just affect them. It affects people around them. And they can become better with God. And not only because she left the house of bread, she went out full. Why was that? She had a husband and two sons. She came back empty. The Lord didn't lead her out, but the Lord brought her back, and the Lord brought her back a widow and childless, and no grandchildren either. She was ruined, she was filled with regret. And the first step on the road to revival was Naomi's confession. This hasn't worked. Lord, you're right. We're wrong. And she was still bitter. God still had to do a lot of work in her. Has he not a lot of work to do in all of us? 
But see where she started to return on the road. If you look at verse 6, please, of chapter 1. She arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. The road of revival home started when she heard of a revival at home. She has been well called the prodigal daughter of the Old Testament. Because you remember, Jesus told our Lord the story of a famine in the land. And a son went to his father and asked for inheritance. And like we have wasted our inheritance, he wasted his inheritance in a far country. And it wasn't until he was at rock bottom and he realized that he couldn't be satisfied in anything that he had done there. That he remembered there is bread in my father's house and to spare. Done this great evil in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. There is revival this very afternoon in parts of our world. Does it not ignite your heart to want one here? Amen. To want one in your life when you hear of the bread. I always confession started her back on the road. But see something else in verse 8 of chapter 1. Orpah's intention. Orpah's intention. I only said of her two daughters. Go return each to her mother's house. Now, just consider the import of this. This is a, a Jewess sending two Moabite girls back to idolatry and paganism. That shows you the advice of backsliders. <laughs> and she even invokes the name of God in it. So backsliders' prayers aren't that useful either. See what happens. Verse 9, she says, The Lord grant you that ye may find rest in Moab. This is impossible. She had become better, and she's sending other people to the bitterness without the living God. See what happens. Do they follow her advice? Well, in verse 10, we see strength in numbers that heard instinct and they plural said unto her surely we plural will return with thee unto thy people so the two daughter-in-laws Ruth and Orpah were saying the same thing we will go with you we're not going back to Moab but by the time we get to verse 14 both of them lift up their voice Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and leaves her and goes back to Moab and Ruth cleave unto her now what happened in between well, if you look at verse 11 through to verse 13, Naomi says, now, now, listen, I have no more son. I haven't got a husband, and even if I had a husband, and I got pregnant, which is impossible, would you be willing to wait around until he grew up to be your husband? I don't think so. There's nothing for you in Bethlehem. Go back. Now, what happened to Orpah's mind was the cost of going back to Bethlehem was dawning on her. And she was realizing, I'm not willing to go through. She had second thoughts. Initially, oh, it all sounded great. When the cost dawned. Now, here's a lesson I do not want you to miss. Please get this, because I believe God wants you to understand this. Naomi was giving this advice, not God. And the devil will give you all the advice he can concerning revival. Now listen carefully to this. It's vital. Whatever the devil tells you is the cost of revival, it's not. Do you understand what I'm saying? The devil will tell you, oh, it will cost this, it will cost that, it will cost the other. And he is a liar from the beginning. Here's why I know it. Ruth got everything and more that she lost. Isn't that right? She got a husband and what a husband she got. She got land that she never had. She became a mother in Israel. And if the devil would have had her going back to Moab with Orpah by believing a lie. Now I knew there's a cost to her life. I knew that. But sometimes I think, and I have a lot to learn, but 
But I think sometimes we can be too negative. Jesus said the thief comes to kill, destroy and steal. I am come that you might have life to the full. Now I'm not saying it's easy being a Christian. Far from it. The Lord wants disciples. He wants our whole life. And for Ruth there was hard work. There was poverty ahead. Without a male provider there was separation from her family home. And loved ones too. But don't believe the lie of the devil that the life we are living this substandard Christian existence is better. It's not like at all. Amen. And whatever cost we have to pay to get it, it will be worth it. Amen. Ten thousand times. Amen. Someone has said bad decisions aren't as bad as indecision. I don't know. I only made a bad decision when we see where it got her. But I only got right with God. You never hear of Orba again. Does that mean you can come to the point of being emotionally stirred about the Bible? Does it mean intellectually? You can understand what it means and what the cost is and you can walk away and that can be the end of your Christian going on with God. I think it's here. Come with me to the third person on this road of revival. We've seen Naomi's confession, Orpah's intention, Ruth's decision. Chapter 1, verse 14. Ruth cleave unto her. Wonderful. Look at these words. Some of the most beautiful in all Holy Scripture. Verse 16. Whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die. There will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also. If all but death part thee and me. She was resolute. She was decisive. She had determination. And let us be delivered from being all talk and all prayer. And let us do something for revival. Amen. She cleared unto my mind. Your God, my God. Now this is where I want to get you. The soldier in Noah. Bad news. The return to Bethlehem starts with Naomi's confession. Ruth's intention is never followed out. Or Orpah's intention, I should say, is never followed out. And Ruth's decision is what really makes the difference. This is the watershed in this whole story. And, and now in chapter 2, in verse 2, we find Ruth in the field of Boaz. And we haven't got time to go into this. But it is just incredible how God providentially guided Ruth into that field. She said to Naomi, I'm going to glean. And you know something, you've got to understand a little bit about, uh, about the law. This was like a welfare tax for the people. That the farmer was to leave some harvest lying around for the poor, for the widow and the orphan to lift, to feed off. And so Ruth could have gone to anything. Now listen, she was a Gentile pagan Moabitess. But she chose Naomi's God as her God. And she didn't maybe know the Bible the way you do. But she knew God's promise in this regard. And simple faith in an immature believer taking God's word and claiming God's promise led her to God's plan. Out of all the things she could have gone to, she ended up face to face with the one man God had appointed to redeem. There's a big difference between a reaper and a gleaner. Did you know that? A reaper was a recognized worker and he earned wages. He was employed by the farmer. But a gleaner was just one of these poor folk. The widow, the orphan, the stranger in the land who, who was allowed this welfare tax, if you like. And you see what Ruth is doing. She's not aspiring to be a, a, a reaper with wages and a position. She's taking the low place. Down the night. Why is she doing that? She's got God's promise now. And she's taking the low place. Here's why. We often hear it said, particularly in gospel preaching, that God sees nothing in us to be gracious. And that's true, isn't it? 
But there is another truth. God resisteth the pride and gives grace to the humble. And you know something, grace is undeserved, amen to that, but grace does not allow humility to go unnoticed. And God lavished his grace upon Ruth through Boaz. Verse 9. Boaz told the young man not to harass her. Keep her safe. We read on in verse 14 that she was allowed to drink of the same vessels and eat of the same bread as the gleaners, the employees. And even Boaz himself reaches some parched corn across the table extra for her. Verse 15. Boaz commands the young man let her glean even among the sheaves. And then in verse 16, he commands him to drop some handfuls of grain on purpose. And she's going home, weighed down with blessings from her near kinsman. Why? Verse 10. She asked that question. Do you not ask it? Why have I found grace in my eye? Why? Because it's grace. My friend, if you want it, you need to take the low place. If we want revival, if I want revival, there must be that brokenness. You see, we're reaching to the heights here. We're looking for God. This is what we want. Not people getting saved. That's what we do want, of course. Not our churches being built up. That's what we want. But those are secondary, even to the land being cleansed. We want God. Isaiah 57 and verse 12, is it? Or 15. He dwells in the high and lofty place with them of contrite spirit. If we want the heights, if we want to reach high, we're going to have to bend up. Are you occupying the low place? Am I? You know, with this great privilege of grace, there's terrible responsibility. In verse 8, Boaz says, Now I've given you all this blessing and gifts of grace. See that you don't glean in any other field. She went back to my home, Naomi, with her arms bursting. And Naomi says the same thing. She says, Make sure none of them, verse 22, none of the maidens of Boaz meet thee in any other field. Are you getting the message? How inappropriate it would be with after Boaz has been so gracious to you to be in another field. It's as if Boaz hasn't done enough. You see? That's what worldliness is. That is what worldliness is. It's not Moab that's attractive. It is the barrenness of Bethlehem. Even if it's not barren, the barrenness of our hearts where we are not satisfied with His gracious presence anymore. When we feel we need more to give us that buzz. When there is a deficiency in our knowledge and experience of the living Christ. That's when learning has come. Do you know who your kinsman redeemer is? Do you understand what he did for you? Have you conceived of the gifts that he has lavished upon you and more that he wants to give? You see, there is a deficient in my heart, in my life, there is a deficient knowledge and experience of Christ. Where are we gleaning? Verse 19 of chapter 2. Where hast thou gleaned today? Where are we getting our joy from and our satisfaction? But let me, as I close, please, in the remaining moments, present you with the kinsman redeemer. The leveret marriage in the Old Testament was a law of Moses that required when a man died childless, a close relative, the closest 
Next of kin should marry the widow, Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 25. The purpose was to perpetuate the family name, to keep the, the land in the, the, the family. Now, since Boaz was a relative of the deceased Elimelech, he was eligible to serve as the redeeming relative by marrying her. But you know, he had to be more than eligible to be a kinsman redeemer. You had to be able. In other words, you had to be wealthy enough to buy back, to redeem the land, to take it on, and even a family. But there's more than eligibility and ability. There had to be an amiableness, a willingness to do it. Now listen, what a picture of the glorious Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. For he has the right to redeem. Ha! Well, he had to be a relative, didn't he? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead, see, hail, incarnate deity, without controversy, great is the mystery of Godness. God was manifest in the flesh. Philippians 2, he came and was made flesh. Hebrews 3, just as children are born to their fathers, he partook of flesh and blood that he might die to put to death him who had power over death, so that he might be a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But my friend, that is not enough. He had not only to be made flesh, he had to be made Sin. He who knew no sin. He who knew no sin made sin for us. I think that makes him eligible, doesn't it? Praise God, he is able. He is Almighty God. Jehovah Jesus, the Son of God, come in human flesh. But more than that even, all would mean nothing if he was not willing. There was a nearer kinsman in the book of Ruth, did you know that? But we read of him in chapter 4, verse 6, twice he says, I cannot redeem, I cannot redeem. It wasn't that he was not Eligible, he was nearer than Boaz. It was not that he was not able, because when, in the beginning of chapter 4, when Boaz brought him to the, 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 the gate of the city and said, Redeem everything that is Elimelech, when he heard about the land, oh, he was ready to redeem. Then he heard about Ruth. Boaz says, Now, if you're going to take the land, you have to take Ruth. That's what he said to him. He wasn't willing to take another way, he wasn't willing to take another family on. But praise God, Christ was willing to take me on. Amen. Why? That's the question Ruth keeps asking. Why? The romance of redemption. He lost his heart to Ruth. Chapter 2 and verse 11. Ruth didn't know anything about this man. He knew all about her. He heard about her relationship with her mother-in-law. He heard about her decision to follow the living God and he lost his heart to Ruth. And the Lord Jesus has lost his heart to you and lost his heart to me. And we need to get to grips with this romance of redemption again if we're ever going to have revival. Fairest of all the earth beside, chiefest of all unto thy bride. Full as divine in thee I see, wonderful man of Calvary. That man of Calvary has won my heart from me and died to set me free. Blessed man of Calvary. And the difference to redeem Boaz only had to buy and to marry our Lord at the plea when he had to die. What should our response be? Repent. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And you know what we need if we are ever going to have revival? We need a fresh vision of our wonderful Redeemer. We need a picture of Christ toward the sinner. In chapter 1, Ruth didn't know Boaz existed. 
Boaz knew all about her. He was compassionate to the stranger. In chapter 2, Ruth is in his field. In chapter 3, she's at his feet. In chapter 4, she's in his family. And it all changed. The whole story and the whole history of this epoch changed when this one little Gentile girl cast her feet at her kinsman redeemer. And that's what we need to do. We need to lie. Go and lie at his feet. In our failure as Christians, he has the right, he has the power, he has the willingness to redeem and to revive whatever is broken. Come and pray like her. Come and pray like her. Chapter 3 and verse 9. I am with my handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman to me. You know what she's saying in our vernacular. Lord, take over. Take all that is mine. Extend the border of thy mantle over me. Take over. Change my life. We heard about the cross. Will you lie there? And rest there? Oh, I have so much I could share with you. In chapter 2, verse 12, she had learned to trust under the wings of the God of Israel. And we, we read later on that, that Naomi Kibber, the advice at the end of chapter 3, the man will not be at rest until he have finished the thing this day. That is a word from God to you, my friend. If you get to the foot of the cross, your kinsman redeemer will not rest until all good toward you is complete. But you've got to get there. You've got to take the low place. You've got to lie there. You've got to rest, you've got to wait, don't work. Yeah. Ruth had spent all her life working for Boaz, but it was when she got to his feet that she rested and he started to work. He started to work. May I finish with this, chapter 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> Boaz was so overwhelmed that Ruth should request this great privilege as far as he was concerned. And you know that's the way the Lord looks at it. We're not trying to prize out of his fingers stingy blessings that he has for us but wants to hold back no more. <coughs> he wants to lavish upon us so much. And, and look at this phrase in, in verse 10 of chapter 3. He, he was overwhelmed. Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than in the beginning in as much. As thou foldest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now, what does that mean? <coughs> Basically, what he's saying is, Ruth, you could have went off and found a new, young, handsome man. You could have forsaken your old family. You could have made a new start for yourself. But you're, you're wanting to revive the old. a new chapter in her life, a new marriage, a, a new job, a new service for the Lord, a new church, a new strategy, a new program. And what we're doing is we're turning to Moab. And we should sit still in Bethlehem and say, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? And I know this is what he wants to do. He wants to revive the old. The difference came in Israel. When Ruth put herself at the feet of her kinsman redeemer and trusted herself <coughs> completely and utterly to him. We are in a legacy in the age in the West. The Lord Jesus looks for the same. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, woman, hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Is that bad that Christ is calling individuals? Be faithful. What a change. Through one girl, Obed was born. Boaz becomes the great grandfather of the greatest king that Israel knew, King David. 
And she is mentioned along with another idolater and adulterer and a harlot woman in Matthew 1 in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Because she got the fate of her kinsman redeemer. The Gaithers years ago wrote a little chorus. If ever there were dreams that were lofty and noble, they were my dreams at the start. And the hopes for life's best 